Hi. G'day, I'm Mark Horseman from Catalyst at ABC. How are you? We're doing well down here. Good, thanks. Good to see you. What brings you to the South Pole? What's the scientific purpose that uh, brings you to that part of the world? The telescopes that we operate here at the South Pole are actually trying to answer questions about how the universe itself began. Pretty big goals. They make use of the extraordinarily, uniquely cold and dry air down here to observe microwave radiation that comes to us from the Big Bang itself. And we've learned quite a lot about the early universe from the observations that we've done down here. Right now we're actually trying to focus on the first instance of time, uh, trying to understand what is the physics that drove the Big Bang. Our best theory of that, uh, called inflation, says that in those first instances of time, general relativity and quantum mechanics combine to produce a rapid burst of expansion, and quantum fluctuations get frozen in the fabric of the cosmos. They are responsible for the evolution that leads to galaxies and stars and everything else, but they would also produce a faint imprint in that microwave radiation. That faint imprint is what we're looking for with our telescopes. And it's so exceedingly faint, we express it in temperatures that are billionths of a degree much, much colder than the temperatures here at South Pole. So the only way to observe signals that faint with a microwave telescope is to take an awful lot of data. And Brad, your work with the South Pole Telescope, uh, is that related? Uh, it is related. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm, I work on the South Pole Telescope, which is a 10-meter microwave telescope, which is also looking at the, the cosmic microwave background, and trying to look at the light left over from the Big Bang, which is uh, brightest in microwaves. and you know, just like a microwave oven works, uh, water vapor absorbs uh, that microwave light. And the South Pole is the driest place on Earth, just simply because it's you know, the coldest places on Earth. And the atmosphere, when, it has such, when it's so cold, can hold such little water vapor that it's much lower water vapor than most of the best other observing sites in the world. And it's a really unique place for these microwave observations. And by looking at this light left over from the Big Bang, we can learn about, we're getting a picture of the universe as it was only about 400,000 years after uh, the Big Bang itself. And so we're getting a very unique baby picture of what the, the universe looked like. And we're trying to use it actually in a somewhat different way, though, to study dark energy, which is uh, this mysterious component of the universe which seems to dominate the total energy density of the universe. There's about 10 times more dark energy than regular matter, such as you find in stars, you know, the planets, you and me. Uh, but So it has dark energy has a mass, but it also seems to uh, contributes to the acceleration of the universe, it's driving the acceleration. So we know the universe is expanding from the big, original Big Bang, but dark energy seems to make it move, move faster. And we don't really understand what dark energy is, but it likely represents something very fundamental about physics of the universe that we don't understand on the larger scales. And so uh, by using these measurements to cosmic microwave background, we can learn something about it and hopefully understand the origins of what physics is behind dark energy. And Sven, I understand uh, your instrument is like a, a telescope made out of a cubic kilometre of ice underneath the South Pole. Is that, is that a fair way to represent it? Yeah, that's fair. We're down here because ice is extremely clear and our telescope is a neutrino telescope. So we need a, a medium that's very clear for our neutrinos to interact in so we could detect them. So you could do that in water, which is what they do in the rest of the world, or you could do it in ice. And the ice is much better because it's stable. And uh, our detector is the biggest one available as well. It's one cubic kilometer. So we place our modules down in the ice between 1,500 and 2,500 meters. We want to detect neutrinos, cosmic neutrinos coming from outer space. So we're actually looking down towards the center of, of the Earth to filter out any other particles because the neutrino interacts very, very seldom. So we're seeing the trace of a neutrino when it interacts in the ice. Now all of your high-tech experiments sound like they generate a hell of a lot of data. Can you give me an idea of what kind of amounts of data are being generated and how you manage to transfer that to the rest of the world with the communication systems you have there? It's one terabyte per day, so it's quite a bit of data. The science is really driven by advances in detector technology and we're constantly trying to make more and more detectors to put in our telescopes and our instruments down here. And, uh, you know, just like you'd put more uh, pixels in your camera, uh, we're trying to hit more pixels in our telescopes. And as we do that, our bandwidth needs are constantly pushed to the limit. And currently, uh, with the South Pole Telescope, we're at about 60 gigabytes per day, which is uh, near our, our quota and the limit of what we can do. But it also has pushed uh, the science that we can do to its absolute edge. And we would need more bandwidth to do 
more science for the next generation uh, instruments to study the, the Big Bang. And to what extent are your experiments uh, limited by the communication constraints you have being out of range of conventional satellites at the South Pole? Well, I, I, I know for us in particular, this, this year we're, uh, we've made some slight compromises. We've basically pushed our, our data bandwidth as low as possible that we feel that we cannot uh, impact the science at our 60 gigabytes a day. But, you know, I think certainly, you know, for a next generation camera, which, you know, we plan to build someday for the South Pole Telescope, you know, we're already at, you know, our limit right now. So I think we would need more bandwidth to, to implement that next generation instrument. Absolutely. We're doing everything humanly possible to compress our data streams, to move it out as efficiently as we can. But when you have uh, as many pixels as we hope to have to go after these faint signals, uh, there's no way around getting more bandwidth. And the next generation of telescopes are going to require far more than we have right now, far more than the current satellites can accommodate. So if someone turned up with a proposal to create a dedicated satellite broadband system for Antarctica, let's say from Australia, for example, what would you guys think of that? <laughs> you know, That's excellent, I think, yeah. <laughs> uh, I think it would be fine with us. Uh, yeah, it would come well to use. Yeah, would be very welcome. I mean, I think even, you know, there's the transfer needs, but then there's also the, the 24 hours of remote access. Remote access. Because, I mean, there's oftentimes, you know, throughout the working day, during the summer when we're setting things up, or the winter, where you just want to do a simple Google search on just uh, maybe a data sheet for some electronics or look up some components that you might not have uh, an instruction manual for down here at the South Pole. And, you know, there's only something about approximately half the day where you can do that. So it right. can be very inconvenient, especially if things are going wrong or breaking. And remote access for our, our observers and our right. scientists yeah. in North America. Uh, the turnaround time on troubleshooting these very complicated instruments that you know, we, we have ambitions to feel down here and do feel down here. Uh, it's limited by the fact that we only get a few hours a day of connectivity. You guys might never yeah, want to yeah, go I, home. I completely agree. <laughs> <laughs> well, most, most astronomical observatories across the world have some level of remote observing. Um, so for the South Pole, like we, you know, we, we entrust our instruments down here with you know, intrepid wind rovers like Sven here to fix things. But of course, you know, there's when things go really wrong, you know, it always helps to have as many hands on deck as possible to log in and try to diagnose what might be going wrong. The system is so complex as very few people know like the, the overall pictures. There's no many experts on the different parts that we rely on. What is your role there as overwinterer? Do you when everyone else when most people go away, are you left there in the dark, uh, making sure things are ticking over? Yeah. So we're the ones solving the problems that arise. So we kind of figure out what it is, and then we find experts in the north to help us out what, with uh, whatever goes wrong. So our task is to keep the telescope running for the entire winter. I don't mean this to be a cheeky question, but I was surprised when I started working on this story that you know, the South Pole and Central Antarctica is out of range of conventional satellites. You know, the United States is known for its space program. I would have thought you guys would have got a satellite up there dedicated to this task ages ago. What's been going on? <laughs> uh, <yeah. laughs> yeah. Well, uh, I know that the U.S. Antarctic program is studying the problem very carefully. Um, and uh, so far the solutions that we've been relying on uh, well, they're, they're very environmentally friendly. We recycle satellites. We use satellites uh, that are quite old. The satellite we're talking on right now is probably pushing 30 years old. And as satellites near the end of their operational life, to conserve fuel, they're allowed to drift off station. And so they come into inclined orbits that are, uh, when they become inclined more than around nine degrees, uh, are visible to the South Pole, but only for a few hours a day. And that's the bread and butter of South Pole satellite communications. It's a bit nerve wracking though, to know that our link to the outside world relies on these extremely old satellites that could fail at any time. And so uh, we certainly would like to see, uh, see a new situation.